Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, my name is Robin Held, and I'm the executive director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. And uh, we're all gathered today for a performance. Um, and I, I want to say a few words of welcome. And I'm going to then introduce Anna Maria Shannon, who will introduce Chad and his work. Um, I want to welcome all of you to the museum. And thank you for joining us today for Chad Goler Sojourner. I have to apologize for my voice. It's, um, I'm, I've got some bug. Um, Chad Goler Sojourner's performance, Marching in Gucci, Memoirs of a Well-Dressed Black AIDS Activist. It's National Coming Out Day. And on behalf of the museum, I want to honor all who have come out as L, G, B, T, or Q. And I want to acknowledge those who work actively as straight allies for equality. Every person who speaks up changes more hearts and minds and works to create new advocates for equality. National Coming Out Day was first observed on October 11, 1988. 30 years ago, on the anniversary of the National March uh, in Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. Coming out and speaking out as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and as a committed ally matters. And it matters today when once again, LGBTQ rights and freedoms are under attack. When people know someone who is LGBTQ, they are far more likely to support equality under the law. And beyond that, our stories can be powerful to each other. And now I'd like to introduce Anna Maria Shannon, uh, Associate Director of the Museum, who will introduce Chad and his performance. Thank you all for being here. Okay, so I get to use this one because I'm too short for that one, just saying. Um, welcome, everybody. First of all, those are here for the common reading program. At the end, Karen Weatherman is standing right back there to swipe your cards. Make sure you do that, please. Don't forget. The art and culture reviewer Lola E. Peters wrote about this presentation, this performance, and Chad. Mass deportation children separated from families, government denials, religion is a tool of hate, and justification for murder. None of these things sounds new to Chad Guller Sojourner. As a young black gay man in Seattle during the 1980s, and a member of the activist gay rights organization, ACT UP, in New York City in the 1990s, he's seen and heard it all before. In Marching in Gucci, Memoirs of a Well-Dressed Black AIDS Activist, Chad wants his audience to remember that the AIDS epidemic was a national crisis that exposed the same fears, prejudices, and evil that we see in today's society. He wants to bear witness to a generation of queer people who risk their lives to save others and share the lessons and wisdom he gained with today's audiences and activists. This performance is actually a third in a series that Chad has done. Uh, the first one, which was called Sitting in Circles with White Girls, Memoirs of a Bulimic Black Boy, which Chad performed here at WSU. It was his very first ever performance of that program. It was done right here at WSU almost 10 years to the day. And that's when I met Chad. And we've been been pretty good friends, yeah, since then. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the second one was titled Riding in Cars, Cars with Black People and Other Newly Dangerous Acts. Um, Chad is one of those types of people who can write whatever's in his soul, and then he brings it out and performs it. So it's memoir on the page, and then it's memoir to you. Please welcome Chad Goller Sojourner.
My first three years in New York City were the epidemic's deadliest. In year one, AIDS became the leading cause of death among Americans aged 24 to 44. In year two, it claimed 40,000 lives, accounting for 23% of all US deaths among men and 34% among black men. And in year three, AIDS death reached an all-time high of 50,000, 8,000 less than the entire number of American casualties lost in the 20-year Vietnam War. So one of my crosses to bear is I'm often the first person anywhere. That includes Monday night ACT UP meetings. The thing about being early to an ACT UP meeting, unless you're smoking, standing around and not offering to help people makes you look like an asshole. So in the spirit of not looking like an asshole, I often found myself setting up chairs, lots of chairs, as at this time, weekly meeting numbers often exceeded 300. The thing about putting up hundreds of chairs each week is after a while, you notice that people are creatures of habit, and when given the choice, tend to sit in the same place each week. Like church on Sunday, each week, act up, set aside time to remember the dead. Unlike church on Sunday, here, they were almost under, always under 40. Keep in mind, at this time, it was not uncommon for gay men who had come of age in New York City to have lost more friends and lovers than they were years old. Until I moved to New York City, I'd never been to a funeral. In fact, I didn't grow up around death. However, within two months, I'd been to a mass funeral in Washington, D.C., and three here in New York City, all for people I never had the pleasure of knowing beyond their seat assignments. I remember calling my parents after a while, and they became almost the measure of how much grief was in my life, because I would tell them about the next friend who was sick or the next friend who was dying, and they were, it was so interesting, because unlike my friends even, they were the ones who would say to me, this isn't supposed to be happening to someone your age. Living in New York at that time was like crazy, because you know, people were getting sick every day three, four, five, six people that you, that you hear about being sick. Here I was trying to deal with having the virus, trying to figure out how to keep myself healthy, and then all of a sudden all of my friends who were my support started getting sick and then started to die. It's 7.45 in the morning on an already humid mid-August New York City day, and I'm standing on the corner of 25th and 1st, hailing my first cab. Where to, he asks. The village, I say. What part, he asks, as if I were to know the village had parts. Luckily, I'm a quick thinker, and so I say, the gayest part. And with that, we have re-entered traffic and are barreling down the street towards the gayest part, as if the gayest part were Walmart on Black Friday and we in search of the last $10 flat screen TV. Luckily, I'm a friend of Amy Grant, and so I break into El Shaddai. This seems to do the trick, as before I can say, Eliana, I and I, we have come to a complete stop at a place I will come to know as Christopher Sheridan Square, where he says, this is it. Clearly, he is tired of my singing and wants me out of his cab. This can't be it, because all I see is a newspaper stand, street sweeper, and bagel carts. My handicapped father did not get me up, did not, excuse me, my handicapped father did not drive me, a, let's, let's back up and try that again. <laughs> my handicapped father did not drive me to the airport at 1 a.m. so I could catch a red eye to experience downtown Bellingham. I arrived in New York City on Tuesday, August 18th, 1992 to attend Hunter College as part of a national student exchange, having spent the past three years at Western Washington University. <laughs> with a true story, with a black population of around 100, 50 of the football team was out of town. <laughs> true story, really was. <laughs> Making Western the perfect school for a black kid with white parents from a virtually all white suburb who not only felt uncomfortable around black people, went so far as to cross the street when encountering multiples of them. I guess you could say that Western Washington University fit 18-year-old me like a J. Crew roll next sweater, safe, familiar, snug. <laughs> By age 20, things had changed, with Western now feeling more like an itchy Montgomery Ward's turtleneck. 
Turns out black college kids aren't that scary. In fact, I soon found myself fully immersed in Western, small yet vibrant and politically active black community. And while my black skill set was, well, severely limited, my dealing with white people's skill set seemed to make up for things. So it made perfect sense when somebody announced that the police had shown up to a relatively tame black house party that I would join, excuse me, that I would accompany the host to meet them. Seems they were here to investigate a noise complaint. It was not yet even 10 o'clock. And unlike the white parties I attended, here they brought back up, as if the potential for grave danger was high. And they were right around the corner. And so they were watching and waiting for that look, that commenter, that gesture, as if, the template, excuse me, as if simply telling us to keep it down might set off the next LA riots. It's in this moment that I realize that they are watching us as I have watched others right before crossing the street. I'm no longer OK with that. And so began in an earnest and intentional journey, a journey out of whiteness and into blackness. I begin by adding Sojourner to my surname, followed by declaring a black studies major and moving to New York City to complete it. So long before Google Maps, there were gay travel guides, free for the taking at the bath bars and dirty bookstores. Having seen many New York City ones before exiting the cab, I ask again, are you sure this is the gayest part? And again, he says, this is it. Regardfully, I pay my fare, exit the cab, and find myself standing in front of the Stonewall Inn, which, by the way, is neither inn nor made of stone or something I would personally find myself riding to keep open. With an hour to kill until dorm check-in, I head down a street I will come to know as Christopher Street, where surprisingly, the further I go, the gayer things get. Among them, a handful of weathered white homosexuals carrying small dogs, both in ill-fitted and non-age appropriate attire. Shopkeepers have begun rolling up. <laughs> Shopkeepers have begun rolling up heavy metal gates, revealing whimsical window displays consisting of dirty books, movies, magazines, sex toys, leather, lube, and dildos. Perhaps there is hope for this Sodom and Gomorrah meets Disney on Ice city after all. As for me, I'm going to be just fine. Like the Bible says, if anyone's in with Christ, he is a new creation. The past is forgotten, and everything is new. So silly me, um, for some reason, I thought if I moved all the way across country, that all my issues and baggage would stay back here in Washington State, and they wouldn't follow me, be a fresh start. Um, it turns out it doesn't work that way. They came up two weeks later, so I'm moving in this huge city. I don't know anybody. And I brought all the baggage with me. And it just hit really quickly. I'm like, wow, um, this is really heavy. And so I began to do escape things. And I, think, and I think activism was part of escape for me because when I was doing that, I didn't have to focus on this. Um, when you jump right in there, it's like, wait a second. You know, if my life is the furnace, then I don't even know what this else thing is, like a, I don't know, lava or something. And so I was able to compartmentalize those issues, um, you know, my eating disorder, my self-identity, all that stuff that I'd hoped had um, been arrested back in Bellingham had come with me. The time you want your luggage to get lost and it just, and it finds you. Damn! It just comes really quickly. I'm like, oh, well, I'm glad, I'm glad some people identify with that. I really, I, I really actually did. That was my thinking. I'm going to move 3,000 miles away. This shit's not going to follow me. Yeah. I was wrong. And because I was wrong, you get to play. <laughs> Thursday, October 3rd, 1985, ninth grade, third period home economics. We are making scones. When Trip Walker Bagley leans over and says, you know what they found in Rock Hudson's wallet? Clearly, this is a rhetorical question. For in the same breath, he exclaims, your picture. I do not get it. Why would an actor who died yesterday have my picture in his wallet? It's not like we were close. In fact, we'd only been introduced two months prior, courtesy of People Magazine's cover story, The Other Life of Rock Hudson. Turns out he was a very famous movie star that made women swoon. He also was a homosexual and sick with something called AIDS. I say something called AIDS because I didn't really know much about it. What caught my attention was the homosexual part. 
I've always known who and what I am, but up until now, I'd never met another bona fide homosexual. And while there is something nice about finding tangible, albeit photographic evidence of your species' existence beyond you, that it came tethered to death, stole some of the joy. ACT UP was founded March 10th, 1987, when during a reading, playwright Larry Kramer asked half the audience to stand up and then told them they'd all be dead in six months. A bold yet not unreasonable proclamation given what was going on at the time. Now six years into the epidemic, with 41,000 dead and 71,000 infected, a president who, despite losing a close friend to it, had only recently said the word AIDS, and not in a hey, this is really bad, let's all come together as a nation and tackle this head-on kind of way. More like, when it comes to AIDS, medicine and morality teach the same lesson kind of way. AIDS was happening to a convenient population, one who at best most people knew or cared little about, and at worst, like Reagan's communication director, Pat Buchanan, thought AIDS was nature's revenge on gays. In fact, the 1995 LA Times poll found that 51% of Americans favored quarantining people with AIDS and 15% favored tattooing them. I have never known a time when sex could not kill me, nor when Trip Walker Bagley and millions of other Americans have not rooted for it to do so. And while painful, this is also liberating. For when people are trying to kill you, there is no need to be polite or patient. I suspect this is why only three weeks after that first meeting, ACT UP held their first demonstration, a march on Wall Street to protest the outrageous profiteering of pharmaceutical companies like Burroughs Welcome, the manufacturer of AZT, which at that time was the only AIDS drug on the market at a cost of 10 grand a year. From the beginning, ACT UP was all about getting life-saving drugs into sick bodies quickly. For this to happen, there needed to be more drugs available, and those drugs needed to be affordable. Need to be affordable. Standing in the way, the food, administer, the food and Drug Administration, whose drug approval process took years, and well, we didn't have years. Plus, there were no regulations governing what pharmaceutical companies could charge, so even when drugs became available, most people couldn't afford them. So on October 11th, 1988, while I was counting days until high school graduation, over 1,000 activists from all of the country descended on Silver Springs, Maryland, and shut down the FDA. Within months, the FDA had shortened their drug approval process by two years. A year later, ACT UP went back to Wall Street this time dressed as brokers, where they chained themselves to the VIP balcony and furling a banner above the trading room floor that said, sell, welcome, becoming the first organization in history to halt trading on the New York Stock Exchange floor. Four days later, Burr's welcome lowered the price of AZT by 20%. Someone once told me that every social justice movement is fought and won by less than 5% of the people who will benefit from it. When it comes to AIDS and ACT UP, this couldn't be truer. ACT UP brought AIDS front and center, like the civil rights, women's rights, and anti-war movements. ACT UP interrupted and challenged the country's collective narrative, and not just around AIDS, but around the rights and responsibilities pertaining to healthcare in general, housing, employment, public access, power attorney, medical proxy, just to name a few. Even same-sex marriage owes much to ACT UP. What would become marriage equality movement began as a movement to, to protect sick and dying gay men from families who wanted nothing to do with them in life, only to, only to come back as soon as they die and lay claim to whatever they left behind. Trust me, nobody hates their gay kid enough to turn down a free New York City apartment. There is something very powerful about being part of a life-changing and saving organization. An organization where when you, where they go low, you don't go high, you meet them where they're at. Because when people with AIDS are under attack, there's only one thing, there's only one thing to do, friends, and that's act up, fight back. Anger and frustration over the AIDS crisis spilled over into a big protest today at City Hall in Manhattan. More than 2,000 people demanding action. 
About 200 of them were arrested for blocking traffic and staging sit-ins. The demonstration was organized by ACT UP, the AIDS coalition to unleash power. ACT UP gave you a sense of empowerment. It made you feel like you were actually doing something about it rather than just being a victim. When 150 people are arrested in front of City Hall in New York City, that's a front page news story. And the fact that people are willing to get arrested and to be carried, you know, physically into a, into a police van and driven off to jail um, makes people stop and think, you know, why are they willing to do that? This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rattle reporting. Good evening. We're going to take a break for a commercial now. Several members of ACT UP, an anti-AIDS activist group, were arrested. CBS believes they entered the studio by using fake CBS IDs. ACT UP has staged many protests for more government funding against the disease, but this was the first time they managed to pull off such a live televised stunt. We're sorry about that. Before moving to New York City, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a group of gay black men here in Seattle. Prior to meeting them, my gay life was entirely white and my black life entirely straight. It often felt like I was straddling two boats roaring towards opposite shores, leaving me no choice but to choose one over the other or drown. Black gay men like Kenny Joe McMullen, Ray Dumas, Cass Jones, and Miss Holiday showed me how to build my own boat, one where my blackness and my gayness were inseparable. I met Fred my second week in New York City while working out of the Asher Levy Community Recreation Center. A high testosterone, lots of grunting, chalked hand, men drinking water out of gallon jugs kind of gym. The kind of gyms where two loud, fast-talking, shade-throwing black snap queens might stand out. A concierge, tray by, a concierge florist by trade, Fred did flowers for the likes of Jackie O, the Mortimers, and the Plaza Hotel. And then the silent bombs began bursting in his blood. And like many, Fred got too sick to work. The thing about artists, we only eat what we kill. When we stop working, when we stop, work, when we stop working, we stop getting paid. There's no accrued vacation, PTO, sick time, short or long-term disability, 401ks to borrow from, or life insurance policies to sell. Like many colored sissies, Fred was estranged from his family. And like many artists, his friends were broke. So when it came to eight, he had no choice but to turn to the state. One of the benefits of being a black kid raised by white parents is honorary white privilege. In my case, that included excellent health care. In fact, it was health care that brought me to Fred's neighborhood twice a week, where I attended both individual and group therapy at the Karen Horney Eating Disorder Clinic. Though not a fan of either, if I have to choose, I prefer group therapy to individual, as I find individual therapy a little too client-focused. I'm not sure if Fred was sick when we first met. This was the pre-AIDS cocktail, and the time between diagnosis and death was often not long. You could look fine at Christmas and be dead at Easter, sooner if you were poor and black. So while I was doing, breather ex so what I was doing, so while I was doing breathing exercises and finger painting with Penny, the fat art therapy lady, Fred was waiting up to 24 hours to be admitted into an underfunded public hospital overflowing with black and brown bodies. By admitted, I do not mean get a room. Back then, admitted simply meant get a wristband and a bed in some hallway corridor where you might stay for days. From literally day one of the epidemic, communities of color, blacks in particular, have been disproportionately affected by AIDS. First report in the CDC's June 1981 Weekly Morbidity and Mortality Journal, the report focused on five patients, all gay white men, Neglecting to, mention, neglecting to mention patients six and seven, one black American man and one heterosexual Haitian male. This helped perpetuate the AIDS as a gay white man's disease narrative, causing many black men to breathe a false sigh of relief. By 1985, blacks accounted for around a quarter of AIDS diagnosis, double our share of the total population. For gay black men, the numbers have only gotten worse. According to, a 19, excuse me, according to a 2016 CDC report, one in two of us is projected to become HIV positive in our lifetime. Like most people, Fred just wanted to live. Also realistic, he 
He knew a long line. A new, a, he knew a long life. This side of glory was off the table, so he did what many people did back then: picked something to live for, something with a date attached to it. For Fred, that something was the annual flower show at the Jacob Javits Center. So he circled the date and prayed to the gods of mercy and grace that Fred would make it. Only for Fred to get sicker and sicker. The sicker he got, the more time I spent with him, socializing, cleaning, running errands, doing laundry, going to the hospital and staking, stalking case managers, now missing more of my own therapy than I was making. My hardest task, trying to get Fred to eat. Fortunately, the less Fred ate, the more I ate, now binging and purging up to seven times a day, something I had not done since high school. For the longest time, I avoided throwing up at Fred's house as the implications were not lost on me. Of course, even a gold star bulimic can only hold so much. And so at some point, I found myself on hands and knees over Fred's toilet, at first masking the sound and shame with running water, then blaming bloodshot and weepy eyes on allergies. While this was enough to fool many people for many years, Fred wasn't many people, and he didn't have many years. So rather than indulge my fake allergies, he opted for a more direct approach, something along the lines of, I know what you're doing in there. I'm just wondering why you feel the need to raise my goddamn water bill while you're doing it. <laughs> like many people with AIDS, Fred got meals from God's Love We Deliver. Founded in 1985, when a woman began delivering food on her bicycle to a man dying of AIDS. By 1997, God's Love We Delivered had delivered over 2,000 meals, excuse me, over 2 million meals. The sicker Fred got, the more his meals began to stack up. So Fred was always offering them to me. An offer I repeated decline, each time explaining that eating, let alone throwing up, Food prepared for people with AIDS and delivered with God's love was a one-way ticket to hell. Bitch, please. You ain't going to hell for eating no chicken tetrazzini. You're going to hell for that dick you're sucking in the park. <laughs> Plus, ain't you the one who say the body needs fuel to live? Well, you want to live, don't you? Don't mess with the snap diva. This is a basic lesson in snap, snap, snap. Diva rats, listen up to this grand diva rat. Snaps can be for long, and snaps can be strong. To read, to punctuate, to cut, like a white boy. Well, you got a domestic snap. You got a snap. Then you got Grand Beaver Snap. Don't get it twisted. The day I tried to kill myself, or as I like to say, bring my biological parts into alignment with the already dead parts of me, began unremarkably. Wake up, roll over, survey damage, check to see if the Today Show is on. Not only did the Today Show provide a perfect blend of news and pop culture, it let me know it was morning. You'd be surprised how many days a year 8 a.m. looks just like 8 p.m. Information critical for someone only now leaving the house for drugs, sex, booze, and cheap Chinese. When I say already dead parts of me, I'm not talking about sad, depressed, numb, or broken in irreparable way parts. I'm talking about non-resurrectable parts, like my father paralyzed, since the stroke of 79, I too have been carrying dead parts for years. It is important that you know and understand this. Truth be told, I'm surprised my lifestyle hadn't brought my biological parts into alignment with the already dead parts of me. 15 years of binging and purging, up to an eight ball a week coke habit, years of risky sex. If ever there were a set of behaviors to send a 25 year old home to Jesus, these would fit the bill. Of course, drugs, booze, sex, and cheap Chinese were not my only vices. There was another. 
Only this was a temporary life sustaining one. And thanks to basic cable available 24 7 during the mid 90s. Behold the Law and Order Marathon. Who knew binging on police procedure and legal drama could keep you alive long after therapy, hope, prayer had failed you? My favorite Law and Order Marathon storyline people who move to New York City to chase their dreams only to end up dying in the process. Personally, I blame that song, you know, the one that says, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. What it doesn't tell you, not only are the odds of you making it here slim to none, no one tells you when it's time to cut and run. Let's face it, New York City does not come with an expiration date or the, or the benefit of 24-7 push button expiration for the benefit of 24-7 push-button access to expertly trained advisors. There is no PA system blaring, warning, warning, you've overstayed your welcome. Get out now before it's too late. Abort, abort. But alas, I too overstayed my New York City welcome. And not because I thought it was the greatest city in the world. That's Willahoochee, Georgia. I overstayed my New York City welcome because like many, I believe my next big break was right around the corner. Here's the thing. While only 13 miles long and 2.7 wide, New York City is a city of infinite corners, a city, where you will run out of, a city where you will run out of you long before it runs out of corners. Of course, if I'm being honest, on some level, I've always hoped I'd run out of me long before, a long time ago. As a child, I would lie in my bed praying to die in my sleep while envisioning my perfectly planned funeral. It's called passive suicidal ideation, when you don't want to kill yourself, but being the dead part sounds cool. Most of the time, it runs quietly in the background like antivirus software. I'm aware it's there, but it's not super intrusive, well, until it is. See, what nobody told me is that passive suicidal ideation can turn active suddenly without any new or triggering events. Those once ambivalent thoughts and feelings now front and center, all that's missing is a plan. Located on the East 4th Street, the Bijou Theater sits in the middle of the block. Its only identifying feature is a large graffiti-covered metal door. I suspect this is not by accident. On the other side, a brightly lit staircase leads down to a landing in a turnstile where a large chain-smoking, gold-wearing Russian man sits behind a window resembling that of a bank drive through As I hand him my money, we exchange pleasantries, for we are not strangers. How are you, I ask. Good, he says, smiles and buzzes me in. Unlike the stairwell, here the lights are low. Having stumbled in the past, I wait for my eyes to adjust, a task even more difficult when assaulted by the strong and familiar stench of bleach mixed with industrial strength disinfectant, the kind where do not mix with bleach is prominently displayed on the label. Upon entering the Bijou, the first thing you will notice is a weathered 40-foot long bar with nothing behind it, one bowl of pretzels on it, and two stools under, under it. However, look closer and you will see its ornateness. A reminder that like this city, it too was once lavish, alive, and welcoming. At the end of the bar is a short hallway leading to the main theater filled with rows of mismatched chairs, half of them covered in garbage bags indicating brokenness. Despite plenty of bagless chairs dispersed throughout, evenly throughout, its four occupants have all chosen to sit next to each other. I, su I suspect this too is not by accident. There is a VCR struggling to play vintage gay porn on a 20-foot screen. By vintage, I do not mean a long time ago. When it comes to gays, porn, and sex, vintage simply means before it could kill you. On the other side of the theater is a hallway flanked by dimly lit booths 
no more than three by three by five, outfitted with wooden benches and eerily resembling those restroom stalls I have been visiting for years. Perhaps that is why I feel comfortable here. Spend as much time as I have scanning playgrounds, school buses, classrooms, and locker rooms for emergency exits and soft places to land. And suddenly, small rooms with locked doors seem like sanctuaries. Like Vegas, these places can be addicted. Find what you are looking for and you will come in search of more. Leave empty handed and you will return in search of that which you sought but did not find. I suspect in my case it's a little bit of both as I've been coming and returning to places like this since before I could drive. It was a crisp October evening. On the horizon, thick blankets of fog and shame waited to roll in. We'd agreed to meet at the local pizzeria. He described himself as white, mid-30s, and attractive. I told him I'd be standing by the pipe organ wearing peach. In hindsight, that may have been an understatement as my outfit consisted of peach linen pants, a long sleeve peach paisley shirt, and a peach cashmere cardigan sweater, all accented by a bottle green chenille scarf. Fierce. <laughs> we drove in silence, and after a while, his hand found its way to my inner thigh, caused my body to react in ways they had never reacted before. By the time we finally stopped and parked behind Swanson's salvage and junkyard, I had started to sweat heavily. Afraid of staining the aforementioned ensemble, I rolled down my window and took off my cashmere sweater and chenille scarf. When I turned back, he leaned in and kissed me. His kiss was more natural than water, making my whole body quiver with delight. Next thing I know, we'd somehow maneuver, next thing I know, we'd somehow maneuvered over the gear shift and landed gracefully in the cramped back seat of his Datsun B210. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, so proud. <laughs> me, when, when, when I finish that, remind, remind me to tell you a story. <laughs> me, shy of 16, him not. Me, straight from church convocation, him straight from the world. Me, never knowing the touch, the taste, the kiss of a man. Him, knowing the touch, the taste, the kiss of many. Without a doubt, the strangest place I'd ever been. Scared crazy, full of every emotion I knew and some I was yet to learn. My head swimming with scriptures. Cleanse me of my sin, O oh Lord, make me white as snow. My body to in desire, touch me, hold me. He kissed me harder and deeper. Gradually, he turned me around and entered me. Turning those feelings, the light I experienced in the front seat of the car into bewilderment and pain, I hadn't expected to go all the way. Noticing my pain, he attempted to reassure me, though of what I'm still not certain. Not that it mattered. What mattered was that he told me that he liked me. Told me I was the best pussy boy he'd ever had. I was overcome with bliss. For the first time in my life, somebody liked my body. Have you any idea how it feels to have somebody find value in the ugliest parts of you? As expected, the bijou booths and hallways have begun to fill up with people engaged in what can best be described as a well-orchestrated movement, one where everybody is checking everybody out. It reminds me of the animal shelter, for here too, excitement, anticipation, desperation, and rejection weigh heavily in the air. However, unlike the animal shelter, here the booth holders do the accepting and rejecting. I think that's why I like to get here early. Better do the rejecting than be rejected. There is no one type of man that comes here. Here you will find men of all colors and ethnicities, the young, the old, the fat, the fit, and in between. Among them are the regulars, the curious, the drugged out, the lonely, the horny, the bored. Some come unabashedly, others in secret and shame. All of us fully aware of the risks associated with unprotected sex. Yet for many, myself included, these risks are often outweighed by simply a need to be touched, held, Desired. Confirmation. I am not as ugly as I think I am, at least not in the dark. When a shadow 
when you can't come up for air. When tomorrow seems to lead nowhere, and there's no answer to your prayer anymore, I want to take away the But I just don't have the words Let me hold you Let me hold you tight Let me hold you Just let me This picture was taken my first week in New York City. And while I'm not sure exactly how much I weigh here, if I had to guess, I'd say 174 pounds, six ounces, give or take. <laughs> which, by which by heterosexual male standards and ordinary gay male standards is pretty good. Unfortunately, I did not move to the land of heterosexual males or even ordinary gay males, but rather smack dab in the middle of high homosexuality society. Turns out, as fucked up as rich white girls are when it comes to body issues, they don't hold a celery stick to New York City gay men. The crumb de la creme of high homosexual society. Where single digit body fat is par for the course, what gym do you go to equivalent to saying hello, and even in the, even in the dead of winter, better be cold than covered up. Not the best city for someone who, after being caught throwing up, started collecting and hiding scales the way most 16-year-old boys collected and hid porn. Spent years avoiding mirrors so as to not catch a glimpse of my stretch mark stomach, stuck together thighs, or overdeveloped chest. Even after the stretch marks had vanished, thighs separated and chest had become defined. For as long as I can remember, I've wanted nothing more than to be beautiful and not that inner beauty crap. The kind of beauty where simply walking into a room throws a hush over the whole crowd. The kind of beauty where it's okay to show up to parties empty-handed because your beauty is gift enough. If given a chance, I would gladly trade my intelligence and wicked sense of humor for that kind of beauty. This is not to say that smart and funny are not admirable attributes. Rather than unlike beauty, their value fluctuates and therefore cannot always be counted on. I know this because I've always been smart and funny, and yet these attributes have not always served me well. In 10th grade biology, Board of Dissecting Frogs, Jason Davis and Steve Flood decided to, dissect, to, decided to dissect me and auction off my lips. For sale to the highest bidder, Chad's rare Nigerian lips. Things like this do not happen to beautiful people. Beautiful people run towards mirrors, not away from them. So I'm in, as am I in no condition to run towards mirror, it makes sense I knew the next best thing. Surround myself with beautiful people, hoping that like AIDS, beauty too is contagious. And therefore surrounding myself with enough of it might hasten the day when at the right angle and with the right light, I too might catch a glimpse of what it looks like to be beautiful, if but for a minute. Until that minute, I will spend days, weeks, and months visiting every Manhattan plastic surgeon offering complimentary consultations, first in search of a new chin, then lips, then nose, then cheeks, chest, and liposuction. In the end, it will be my lack of funds separating me from the better versions of me. While heartbreaking, I take comfort in the knowledge that should I ever come into money, there are far better versions of me waiting in doctor's offices all over New York City. There are gay men all over this city searching for right angles and right lights in hopes, to, in hopes they too might catch a glimpse of what it looks like to be beautiful, if but for a minute. The difference between them and me, I'm looking forward to beauty yet to come, they in reverse for beauty now gone, neither of us without compromised wounds or scars. Like Ted, a once fit muscle queen now walking the streets of Chelsea, a mere shell of his former self. Eyes hollow, cheese sunken, and makeup covered lesions for days. 
still holding on to his gym membership as if it were a prayer card, as if to remind him, I have not always looked like this. Once upon a time, we traveled to South Beach, Provincetown's Palm Springs, and Los Angeles for no other purpose than to gather with the beautiful. We being Scott, his partner, a mirror image of 10 years who, who, who had predeceased him by six months. Hang out in Chelsea long enough and you will notice a pattern. The beautiful tend to date people who look like them. And not in a water seeks his own level kind of way. More in a, I'm so beautiful I would date myself if I could, but I can't, so I will find and date my reflection. Like Ella Peter. Raised, nurtured, and most at home in rooms full of nothing but mirrors where he would dance six days a week up to 10 hours a day. His well-proportioned body, a majestic combination of skin covering the muscles and ligaments and bones. If ever there were a place to catch beauty, it'd be among dancers, like Ella Peter. Before his body became so riddled with AIDS and toxic medications, that he has not left his apartment in weeks, eaten in days, speaking no longer worth the effort, pine soul no longer masking the sense of shit, vomit, sweat, and despair, what sleep that comes arrested by vivid nightmares and trips to the bathroom now require crawling on hands and knees. And so he sits and stares at a shelf he can no longer reach, as if to say, see that? Those are every pair of dance shoes I've ever owned. Did I tell you about the times I danced with kings and queens of heads of states? When I'm gone, make sure you tell them that story. You know, the one where I was beautiful. When my father had his stroke, Christian women brought over so much food we had, to, we had to hit up neighbors for freezer space. When our very Catholic next door neighbor's daughter suicided and their church turned its back on them, I took them warm cookies. So when the man dined alone on the other side of Fred's curtain said, baby, what you know about red velvet cake and ice cold milk? I did not tell him my parents were white, and not southern white, but Montana white, and so I'd never heard of it. Instead, I said, red velvet cake, that's my favorite. 
Despite my complicated relationship with food, from a young age, I have witnessed its sacramental and Eucharistic powers. The AIDS crisis was no different. There is something about dying that makes one long for the food of their childhood. For those who sick to eat, sometimes just the smell of grandmother's yeast rolls can be grace sufficient. Having grown up in a liberal Christian home, the thought that access to these foods might be conditional was, well, or outright denied, was like, unchristian. When people got sick, you took them food. End of story. Turns out there were other stories like those of unrepenting gay men estranged from the conservative Christian families and by extension, the foods of their childhood. So when he said he hadn't had red velvet cake and ice cold milk in forever, I knew in his story, cake and love were conditional. I would learn how common his story was. Dare I say, the greater the childhood connection to food, the greater likelihood of family estrangement. Say what you want about Pentecostals and Southern Baptists, but they can cook. While many Christians turned their backs on people living and dying with AIDS, others didn't. A group of Puerto Rican women gathered weekly in the Bronx to say the rosary on behalf of gay men who died of AIDS. Catholic priest Father Michael Judge, who was killed on 9-11, visited the hospitals and families administering last rites and presiding over funerals when parish priests refused. Other churches provided financial and other types of support well beyond spiritual. As for me, I serve God's people cake, <laughs> believing that the last thing that should touch your mouth should be good, pure, and holy. And so began the sacramental and Eucharistic ministry of Uncle Peach's Cakes and Cobblers, where everything is better than butter and love and black Jesus is Lord. And I wasn't alone. Turns out for every black mother unwilling to make her dying son's favorite seven at pineapple coconut cake, there were 100 other black baking mothers at the ready, as were Puerto Rican mothers willing to make pastelas Caribbean mothers, a key in saltfish, and Italian mothers, linguine and clams. Each dish confirmation of Christ's most radical proclamation that we are his body. And if we are the body of Christ, then the body of Christ has AIDS. Lord, as we and all should be with you. Let me do breakfast. <laughs> so, in Seattle, I'm telling you to pause. There's this pregnant pause that always happens in Seattle. So, those heathens. Well, let's try that again. You much more sanctified over at Christian Mount. I forgot about that. <laughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us just thank the Lord our God. Yes, On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to his father, broke it, gave us to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, again gave thanks to his father, said, Take, drink, this all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant. Shut out for your sins and forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as your holy and living sacrifice. For all that your Holy Spirit has gathered here and on these gifts of cake and rent, on these gifts of red velvet cake and milk, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ to be by his blood. Brothers and sisters, when you are ready, all things are ready. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come, holy people, taste and see that the Lord is good. We invite those who would like to come forth in that holy communion of the Red Velvet King. Taste 
So for those that once, as you know, it's been consecrated, so we can't throw it out. So somebody after we get, you have to finish it. So some, I mean, some you have to come back for seconds. If you didn't, but it has to be gone. That's the rule. Once it's been consecrated, it cannot be thrown out. So we can do that, right? We think we can take care of that. So, you got, you got me. Yes, okay. See, that's black Jesus. White Jesus don't get wrapped up. Gotta be black Jesus. In the book of Daniel, King Darius of Babylon decides to appoint 120 leaders and three administrators to rule throughout his kingdom. One of those administrators being Daniel, who so impressed the king, he's about to be made an administrator over the whole kingdom. This didn't sit well with the others, so they decided to get rid of Daniel. Unfortunately, all they had on him was that he prayed to a God he couldn't see. Luckily for them, King Darius was already senile, and so they tricked him into signing an irrevocable decree outlawing prayer. When Daniel learned of the decree, rather than stop praying, he opened his windows towards Jerusalem and prayed three times a day, giving thanks to God just as he'd done before. When the others saw this, well, they ran and snitched to the king, who despite wanting to save Daniel, had no choice but to have him throw him into the lion's den, but not before saying, Daniel, may the God who you serve continuously rescue you. The next morning, and after a sleepless night, the king returned to Daniel's, to the lion's den and cried out in anguished voice, Daniel, has your God who you serve continuously delivered you from the mouths of lions? And Daniel said, yeah, we cool. <laughs> and the king was overjoyed. So overjoyed that after throwing all Daniel's haters into the lion's den, he issued another decree, this one to all the nations and people of the earth, commanding them to revere and serve the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. For he rescues and he saves to perform signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. I have always believed in God bought childhood Bible stories hook, line, and sinker. It was these stories that carried me through the rough patches, and there were many rough patches. By age 12, I could recite all the books of the Bible, Old Testament and New. 
And while other kids were wasting time learning to believe themselves, I was swallowing these books whole in anticipation of having to purge scripture onto my classmates. Yet, it's been three months, eight days, six hours, four minutes, and 1,000 seconds since I've heard the voice of God. Have you any idea how it feels to be a baptized believer and no longer hear the voice of God? It's homophobia and AIDS hysteria were everywhere, including the streets of Greenwich Village. For many of us, the only place to feel safe and free were bars and clubs. More than places to socialize, they allowed us to experience pleasure and self-indulgence with us at the center. And there was no better center than a New York City gay dance club. Step inside and you will find pulsy music, go-go boys, cigarette girls, light shows on par with those northern ones. Oh, and then there's the 2,000 square foot bathrooms overflowing with chase lounges, chandeliers, and original artwork. Think the Garden of Eden before and after the Apple incident. Why? You almost forgot that in the time it took for the DJ to remix Selma Houston Saturday night, Sunday morning, someone would have died of AIDS. Or that five blocks away, a 16 year old version of you is getting off a bus with a garbage bag of old clothes and a body full of fresh boozes. Courtesy of a father who caught himself, for courtesy of a father who caught him kissing a boy. That before that first bump of coke, your depression felt like midnight in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Yet here you are, dressed for the gods, dancing the night away. Who wouldn't want to hang out here and as often as possible? The first time I did coke, my friend Robert and I were hanging out at the Sound Factory bar when he said, Hey, want to get some coke? To which I replied, Sure, why not? It's Tuesday. <laughs> my underlying theme of my, one of the underlying themes of my, of all my stories is it all made perfect sense at the time. <laughs> prior, to moving to, prior to moving to New York City, my only experience to drugs came courtesy of Nino Brown from New Jack City. Dark abandoned rat filled buildings where junkies slid money and brokenness through door slits under the watchful eyes of well positioned gun toting lookouts. Imagine my surprise! Imagine my surprise! Discover that in addition to being friendly, New York City gay dealers were easier to find the Kochek, were easier to find than the Kochek girls, and their lines moved quicker. While we hadn't discussed drugs before this moment, it was clear that Robert knew what he was doing which involved dipping a key into a small brown bottle then sticking it directly under his nostril and inhaling. inhaling. Worried I would drop the bottle when it came time for my turn, Robert again dipped the key into the vial, this time positioned it directly under my nostril. Now, I'd like to say that prior to inhaling, I suffered some deep internal conflict, conflict something on par with Jacob wrestling with God, but no, I, well, I just inhaled. And for the first time, felt beautiful. Not the most beautiful boy in the room kind of beautiful, but a far cry from the ugly, insecure, sad, dark-skinned black kid full of pieces that fit but never mattered, but matter, or, or mattered but never fit. As if that wasn't enough, for the first time in my life, I wasn't hungry. What years of therapy, antidepressants, faith, self-help book had failed to accomplish, cocaine accomplished instantaneously. I was beautiful and not hungry. So Robert said, so when Robert said, how do you like it? Of course I said, can we get more? <laughs> when it comes to drugs, we gays are what sociologists call early adopters, with some reports finding gay men three times more likely to do drugs than straight people. There are a lot of theories on why, including the risks and isolations and shame associated with being gay, often leads to both personal and communal trauma when left untreated Sufferers often experience a heightened sense of danger and risk. Translation, the more shit you go through, the more willing you are to take risks and do impulsive things, especially when they come with instant rewards. 
Like how in a city where food wasn't cheap and public bathrooms hard to come by, doing drugs in the beginning was cheaper and easier than binging and purging. Or how my blackness allowed me to bypass, soon allowed me to bypass club dealers and go straight to the source, giving me cheap access to the best drugs in the city, which I parlayed into social and sexual currency, granting me entry into a world of the rich and beautiful and powerful gays. Life was good for about nine months. <laughs> Turns out when you're already addicted to something and you introduce another addictive substance, say cocaine, there's no trial period. The queen has left the runway. Destination, rehab, with an S. Um, I remember one incident, um, I was working a job and I you know, had a binge and so I was going, called in to go on um, short-term disability and was calling around to find a rehab. And I was living in Jersey City and I found this place, I didn't know it at that time, but it was a place where people who aren't insured go. And I went in and had a conversation, like, oh, it's gonna be three years for bad. I'm like, oh, that's a long time. She's like, yeah, when people don't have insurance, it takes that long. Well, I'm like, well, I have insurance. I go, oh. And I was walking home, like a 20 minute walk. But when I got home, there was a message from them saying, hey, um, we found you a place. It's a Boca Raton. Can you go in the morning? Now, this is winter. It's winter in Jersey City. And like, can you go to, I'm like, Boca Raton? Well, of course, this is how I'm thinking. Like, Boca Raton? Fun. Can I, can I go in the morning? No. Because I have to go shop. So I told them I had to go two days later. Because, like, you know, I have nothing to wear. So here's me going to rehab. But I have to postpone rehab so I can go shop. Because you can't go to Florida with, the, with no um, you know, summer clothes. Um, and that's, that's just, that was my thinking. That's just how I thought. Um, maybe it's still how I kind of think. I look really good though. I'll get off that plane. Woo! Couldn't tell me shit. <laughs> so that one didn't work, just so you know. <laughs> one of my earliest and most significant act up actions involved chaining myself to the gates of Hoffman LaRoche pharmaceutical companies. The poorly absorbed and underdosed in its current state, their protease inhibitor was first to market, allowing them to set whatever drug price they wanted, which would go on to be the drug price which other, which other drug companies would set their prices. So when someone suggested we take a field trip to Nutley, New Jersey and pay them a visit, we were all in. Well, except for a few of the Chelsea queens who needed some convincing. Not for the action, more for the whole New Jersey thing. Having never been a fan of lifting and carrying things, a sissy like myself joining the chain acquisition team might seem like an odd choice. However, a sissy like myself joining the all-lesbian chain acquisition team, now that's brilliant. We agreed to meet on Saturday at the Lesbian and Gay Center, where I came dressed in burnt orange Ferragamo wool slacks and a Kelly Green Navy pea coat and matching, and with matching Eddie Barra duck shoes. My motto, dress for the rapture, Nothing worse going home to meet Jesus looking like a hot mess. As for the lesbians, well, they came dressed like lesbians. <laughs> UPS delivery lesbians, Sarah Lawrence alum lesbians, militant lesbians, Title IX lesbians, and my favorite, soon you will call me Brian lesbians. <laughs> Together, these women made up the AIDS crisis greatest and least appreciated heroes often walking directly into the fire and through it at a time when massaging often went unchecked in the gay community. Yet when the AIDS crisis struck, it's these same women who dropped everything and provided care and comfort to those same men. Men who not only lost their friends and lovers to the disease, but many abandoned by their families and treated like pariah by the medical establishment as there was still much hysteria around how HIV was transmitted. In fact, it was not uncommon for medical providers to don two, three, even four sets of latex gloves before touching AIDS victims. That's what we called them back then as there weren't enough survivors to warrant their own classification. Yet time after time, I witnessed barehanded lesbians check for fevers, apply bombs to lesions, or simply hold a hand as it hung liciously from the edge of a shit-stained, sweat-drenched bench bed, something one might expect a mother to do. I have been to enough transitions to know there is something different when mothers are in the room. I once bore witness as a mother anointed her child's head with oil and whispered, beloved fruit of my womb, I knew you before this cruel world knew you. Then, now, and forever in you I am well pleased. But not all mothers were well pleased. Like Peter, they too denied the one they claimed to love. 
There is a Latin phrase, in loco parentes, it means one who acts in the place of the parent. Enter Erica, a 250 pound black butch with a bad knee. Watch as she lowers the bed rail, hoisting herself up and over, where she cradles the shell of a dying man, rocking back and forth as if she were Mary and he or Christ. In the end, no longer able to stave off death in this galloping pale horse, she simply holds court, waiting for that moment. The one where his lungs will become so filled with fluids he is literally drowning. And so death enters the room, sits between them and whispers, prepare your ark today for we shall report shortly. Only sometimes shortly is too long, too painful. So mercy and grace enter the room. Mercy in the form of a physician willing to provide enough morphine to release him. Grace in the form of a lesbian willing to administer it. When we finally arrive at the hardware store, the first thing I notice, it's unlike any hardware store I've ever been to. Where I come from, in addition to the nuts and bolts, they also carry pretty things like track lighting, brass fixtures, and pansies. The closest thing to a pansy here, me. Not only were lesbians great caretakers and procurers of hardware, they were also great organizers, a much needed skill set for a new organization where the majority of its members had little to no prior experience with activism. Where many gay men saw a system that once worked for them had now betrayed them, lesbians didn't see a flawed system in need of tweaking. They saw a system that never worked in need of dismantling. <laughs> The kind, of mindset you, the kind of mindset you need when your first campaign is taking on the Center for Disease Control, which neglected to look at the ways in which AIDS manifested in women. Instead, basing their definition on a relatively small group of mostly gay men, resulting in many infected women not even knowing, and those who did seek treatment for AIDS-related symptoms were often told they had the flu and sent home to die. So women like Maxine Wolf and Sarah Shulman started ACT UP New York's Women's Committee. After a four year women don't get AIDS, they just die from it campaign. In 1992, the CDC expanded their AIDS diagnosed definition to include invasive cancer of the cervix, reoccurring, excuse me, reoccurring bacterial pneumonia and pulmonary TB. With chains in hand, we exit the hardware store and make our way back to the community center. Having been raised right, I offer to carry something. My request thankfully denied. <laughs> Turns out when he walked directly into the fire and threw it, held frail hands hanging from the edge of shit-stained, sweat-drenched bed, taken on the CDC while cradling the shells of dying men, carrying chains is nothing. Let's face it, you've been doing the heavy lifting all along. Just before the march started, I turned around and behind me I just saw a sea of lesbians and it was just, in, it was an incredible sight. And uh, we just set off down, down the road. It was like going to Oz. Tampa Bay Act Up, I'm a lesbian with HIV, I'm a pissed off dyke, and I want my rights back. It's 322 in the afternoon and the temperature is pushing 100 degrees, and the humidity makes it feel like 110 down here. I'm sweating like a runaway slave, the subway platform smells like piss and fermenting malt liquor. I want to sit, but the only bench is draped with official police tape, crime scene, do not cross. There's a sister standing nearby, so I turn and say, See that police tape? It comes in rolls of 1,000 feet. Did you know the circumference of the Earth is 24,901 miles? And then one mile equals 5,000 
280 feet. So in order to circle the Earth, I need 131,481 rolls of that there tape. It's been 364 days, eight hours, 10 minutes, and 1,000 seconds since Ephraim's death. My pain is no longer cloaked. Rather, it stirs the ghosts that inhabit this city. Since the death of my beloved, I have mourned to do tongues and face, and still the God of my childhood has yet to send condolences. Oh, I understand that death must visit every home, but how shady of death to visit a home where the living had just begun. There are many times I pleaded with death to come for me. Why not then? Why now? Why Ephraim? Why our home? Jehovah Jireh, you must have heard me plead the blood. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood for healing and restoration upon this name, upon this home. Worthy is your name. I must have said it a thousand times and many more. And if that wasn't enough, I summoned all the elders of the church and they laid hands on him, prayed and anointed him with holy oil. Though still in the distance, that one faint sound of death and his galloping pace horse was growing louder and louder, and Ephraim's breath was becoming shallower and shallower. As I replied, flat, fresh lambs blood every door, windowsill, windowsill and bedpost, I whispered, hold on, this home is protected by a blood covenant. Death must pass over. Death did not pass over but walked right in, sat between Ephraim and me, and whispered, prepare your ark, for you shall leave port shortly. Death of my beloved left the port exactly two hours, 20 minutes, and 1,000 seconds later. I can't remember a time when death, grief, and rage were not part of our lives. Ephraim and I met while planning to act up New York's first political funeral, The Ashes Action, October 11th, 1992. We carried the actual ashes and bone fragments of loved ones we had lost in a funeral procession to the White House. For an act of grief, rage, and love, we deposited their ashes on the White House lawn, chanting, history will recall, Reagan and Bush did nothing at all. With that, we ushered in a new form of AIDS activism, fierce, defiant, and unapologetic. Truth be told, most people, myself included, didn't believe we'd get anywhere near the White House fence, now guarded by police and riot gear police on horseback, police posing as protesters. But that day, the White House would become Jericho and act up with, in fact, the spirit of Joshua. It should have been there. Soon, the lawn would become frosted with the red men of unfished lives, love stories, and potential. It would sparkle with empty urns, bowls, baggies, even a Chanel hat box. I like that classy to the end. I remember looking up through my tears, perhaps for God, perhaps for Zion, the city on the hill, but I saw where blankets of fog, shame, and indifference rolling in. Still I prayed in the way my mother taught me to pray, saying, Lord, into thy hands I return your sons and daughters, make them whole again. As if on cue, heaven opened up and began to weep, her tears forever cementing the extraordinary lives into the soil and perhaps the conscience of a nation. There would be many more funerals and actions, a month later, November 2nd, we would honor our friends and fellow activists' final requests, which would be buried furiously. After simple service, we ventured in the cold and rainy Manhattan gloaming, where we carried the open casket containing the lifeless body and passionate spirit of our friend from the West Village to 43rd Street, where we lay them in state at the, head, where we lay them in state at the doorsteps of the New York State Republican headquarters. The next day, I would bring about change. Clinton would take the White House. Ephraim and I would, would attend Active's victory party at Mr. Fuji's Tropicana, where we would dance until last call, and Alphaville's Forever Young would play continuously as the DJ had left for the evening. Most importantly, that night, deep within my heart, I stopped believing that there was nothing on this planet that validated, protected, or encouraged my existence. Ephraim had impregnated me, impregnated me with a new heart song, one I'd hoped we'd sing forever. I looked down the tunnel, still no subway in sight. My freshly laundered shirt is now drenched in sweat. Thinking out loud, I exclaim, I hate this city. Translation, it's been 364 days, nine hours, 10 minutes, and 1,000 seconds since Ephraim's death which means I've been waiting for the subway for exactly an hour. More importantly, death has yet to call me home. And so I wait and listen, 
waiting for death on his galloping pale horse, listening for the words, prepare your ark for we shall report shortly. These words will reunite me with my beloved and perhaps then my heart will sing again. Built between 1927 and 1931, the George Washington Bridge spans 4,760 feet connecting Upper Manhattan to New Jersey. Made of unadorned cables and steel, it has been described as the most beautiful bridge in the world, the only seat of grace in a disordered city. Yet every 3.5 days, someone makes their way to the pedestrian walkway to attempt or complete suicide. There is no fencing, there is no netting, there is no wall. The only barrier between them and the Hudson River, 25 stories below, is a waist-high metal handrail. Suspended 40 feet higher than the Golden Gate Bridge, the fall takes less than three seconds at more than 55 miles per hour and creating, creating 30,000 pounds of force upon impact, upon, upon impact. And I'm standing on its edge, having come so that I might crash to earth to fly home to Jesus. As I begin to rock back and forth, everything goes silent. Like Christ on the cross, I cry out one last time, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And like mourning, silence is broken. It is the voice of my birth mother, a woman I've never nor will, a woman I've never nor will ever meet. She says, beloved, he has given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. But right now, baby, I, I need you to step back. From the river now rises the voice of my mother, the one who chose me and named me. She says, Chad Elliott, do not fear, for he is with you. Do not be dismayed, for he is your God. He will strengthen you and help you, upholding you with his righteous right hand. But right now, Chad, I need you to step back. But moms, this world has nothing for me. Step back, they say. But moms, in my father's house are many mansions. Step back, they say. But moms, like the widow's might, I have given all of me. There is nothing left to give. Step back, they say. But moms, better is one day in his court than thousands elsewhere. Step back, they say, and say, and say, for did not he deliver Daniel?
David, my Lord, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel. Did my Lord deliver Daniel and why not every man? He delivered Daniel from the lion's den, Jonah from the belly of the whale, and the Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, and why not every man? Did my Lord deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel, deliver Daniel? Did my Lord deliver Daniel, and why not every man?